this unbelievable boon for America's technology sector. Yet, you know, the, the thing is, when you look inside of China, they are extremely good at process engineering. They're also extremely good at additive manufacturing. You know, they're extremely great in things like specialty chemicals. But all of those things, when you think about the precursors, come from American, European, Australian companies that now have a huge incentive to diversify that supply chain away from China. We're dealing with two things. One is just that if you really think about it, if, if I had said 13 months ago that we would be sitting here today and the Fed would have hiked you know, 500 basis points in nine months, plus or minus, you would have thought it was crazy. So we're sort of like coming into this phase of sobriety trying to figure out how do we all do our jobs differently and what does it mean for the investments that we've already put in the ground? And for me personally, I think it really, the setup is that it amplifies tail risk. You know, the risk is that the S&P earnings are sort of with a one handle, 180, 185, and all of a sudden the S&P is, you know, 3,200, 3,300. But then there's this right tail risk, which is that the Fed becomes dovish, everybody capitulates because it looks like things are slowing down, and now all of a sudden, though, you will have to deal with terminal rates that are going to be 4 to 5 percent on a more consistent basis because if he lets off the gas now, then inflation kind of sticks around. Yeah. So both roads lead to repriced assets just in very different path dependency. And those risks to me are a little um, heightened. And so I've tried to kind of be quite conservative and just you know be down the fairway. There's a lot to learn when you look at the past, which is that a high rate environment, at least in the area in which I operate, which is you know um, technology businesses, we've actually counterintuitively built better businesses during periods of high rates. Yeah. And the reason is because there are fewer allocators that come to our part of the market because you can find better risk-free rates, as you said, the two-year, you know, even down to T-bills and repo, quite honestly. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is that in the absence of this surfeit of capital, it forces each individual company to frankly just be better managed because there's less money. And so we become, as an ecosystem, more intolerant of excess. And all of that just creates better run businesses. And so we haven't had that cycle for probably 14 or 15 years. Um, and so we desperately need it, because if you look inside a lot of technology companies, they're unfortunately rotting from the inside out, right? They've had a period where they've been able to raise successive amounts of capital to fund a valuation creep that frankly won't translate into what the actual money is you're gonna get back. Um, in our industry, you know, there's a couple of dirty little secrets or like the dirty soft underbelly. One of them is that only 10% of all of the firms in our asset class actually generate real returns, 10%, which means 90% are basically floundering around burning money. The other thing is, is that we have always consistently generated a high single digit DPI, so like 1.7x is like the 30 year average on distributions. Yet we are the worst defender when it comes to showing people, like you guys, paper markups or TVPI. So there is this dance that, that this industry has been able to play because rates have been at zero. So as investors, the asset class, I think, is very challenged in order to generate real returns now. The companies that we funded have, as a result of all this excess capital, been more poorly run than otherwise. And so we need to course correct. So we need these rates to be sustained for you know, five, six, seven years, frankly, hopefully, in order to really flush it through the system. We've had these things where we've had these major themes that we've always invested in, which is early stage venture, largely in healthcare and software and deep tech. Um, and so that's been a consistent theme and recently energy transition. That's been our bread and butter. But every few years, it, it has turned out that we sometimes go a little off piste. And you know, in the early you know, 2011, I went off piece and I made a huge bet in Bitcoin when it was 80 bucks a coin. It just seemed like just an unbelievably massive risk reward. We did the same thing in the mid 2000s. We did it in SaaS. Um, we did it in deep tech. And SPACs, you know, we stumbled into this thing because we wanted to raise money for a bunch of our companies that were extremely capital intensive. 
And we demonstrated something that in a moment just caught a lot of wind. So yeah, as you mentioned, you know, we did six of them. I think there were 650 of them just in 2021. So we're you know, about 1% of the market. You know, I think we bought good companies well. I think we sold well, quite honestly. But it's one of these things where it was fueled by a moment in time of just enormous excess liquidity. And now I think we're sort of back to basics. So for us as an institution, we're kind of back to early stage venture. Who knows, we may go off piece at some point to really try to ton it. That's our job as investors, right? Is like, we allocate risk well, we maintain top quartile returns, but when there's a window, you know, I have, you know, I'm the largest LP in my fund, so when there's a window, I go for it. And that was a moment where we tried to go for it. I think the problem with growth investing, just to give you some anecdotal data, like at the end of last year, I looked at six, seven converts. And these were all extremely well-known companies that all of you would know on a first name basis. And they all came to me trying to raise convert. And I said, well, here's the real market clearing price of these companies, and none of them took my money. And instead, they did a convert to basically deflect and kick the can down the road on valuation. So we're in that point in the market where all the boards of these private companies refuse to budge on valuation. And the reason is because it impacts meaningfully their DPI or their TVPIs that they've given to LPs. And so it's a very difficult part of the private markets right now to invest in because you will not be allowed to do true price discovery because nobody wants to take the real hits. The best companies will do it. I mean, I think you saw today that Stripe may take a 50% down round. That's probably the best technology company in Silicon Valley proper being built right now. So they'll do it. Klarna did it. In fact, it's so interesting that it's all, you know, the through line there is Sequoia, which is an extremely disciplined and incredible organization. So they're able to enforce that discipline. But other companies, other venture funds, they don't want to look at the TVPI decay. And so it's uninvestable, quite honestly. On the other end, early stage venture has always been where the real gross dollar profits are made. And if you overlay that with a rising rate environment and you regress that back 30 or 40 years, in fact, we did it looking back 60 years, the most incredible opportunities to make money are actually when rates are rising in early stage venture. That's just the historical artifact if you look at public companies and size. So, you know, we said very explicitly, okay, no more growth. The default answer right now is gonna be no, we're not gonna to touch it, but we're gonna to continue to sort of over-index into early stage and do as many good deals as we can see and you know, let the chips fall where they may. The most important thing are who can generate DPI? Who actually gets money back into your pocket? Forget paper markups because they're kind of not really worth the paper that they're printed on. Where are the distributions so that my, my actual assets can be more right-sized? They are the ones that I think start this trend of bottoming. Because what will happen is you'll go to the organizations that have had the most consistent TVPIs with the most inconsistent DPIs and say, I can't work with you anymore. Because this is now just money bad. And when those folks leave the market, those companies now become more prone to get repriced accurately because that set of GPs will say, I need to return money. And that's where guys like us can step in with clean balance sheets and lots of money to go and say, okay, let's go and reprice these. I honestly think that's like three years away. Yeah. I thought it was gonna be three quarters away. You know, at first when we were thinking about like, how much capital are we really gonna be allocating over this next period? We cut it by two thirds mm -hmm. because we just didn't see the opportunities in the late stage anymore. These are multi-trillion dollar shifts in how the information economy and, and as a result, the economy itself is gonna work. You know, right now today you can generate using solar and wind energy that's effectively approaching zero. Mm -hmm. And it's cheaper than that gas. And not, it's not just at the residential level, but it's also at the baseload power generation level. And so as a totality, you have the ability for 100 million US homeowners to effectively displace 1,700 utilities and all of that monopolistic behavior and regulatory capture. And so if all of a sudden you have free abundant energy that you can collect from the sky and store in your garage and direct anywhere you want, you all of a sudden have the ability to solve problems via brute force 
that before you couldn't because they were boundaries of energy. Separately, we have found a way to transition away Moore's law away from CPUs into these application-specific chipsets now that operate in a realm of machine learning and AI. And the cost of that is effectively going to zero because these reference designs now are so well understood. The software is so powerful now. And when you multiply these two things together, if you wanted to brute force, reverse engineer every single theoretical protein that binds to every other protein in your body, what was a multi-billion dollar compute and energy problem is now effectively a few tens of millions of dollars. If you actually wanted an infrastructure that could actually detect in real time how to give true autonomous self-driving, make extremely complicated decisions, and stop on a dime, those were compute problems that you can now basically make render costless. And so when those two things come together, it's one of these really transformational moments in our society where you can go after some very big problems that we didn't think were tractable before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very excited about that intersection and finding companies that play on those themes. It's an unbelievable boon for America's technology sector. Yet, you know, the, the thing is, when you look inside of China, they are extremely good at process engineering. They're also extremely good at additive manufacturing. You know, they're extremely great in things like specialty chemicals. But all of those things, when you think about the precursors, come from American, European, Australian companies that now have a huge incentive to diversify that supply chain away from China. That benefits American companies in a massive way. And so China's response is muted. So for example, we said we are going to slow down the flow of extremely advanced semiconductor manufacturing equipment into China. China's response said we are not going to allow you guys to get the input components to uh, certain um, silicon wafers that are used in PV cells. I mean, if you had to rank these things, no offense, but we can make solar cells. <laughs> the equipment that you need to get to two nanometer scale in chip design comes from the Dutch, the Germans, and the Americans. And so it's a really interesting moment where this, you know, the game theory optimal view is that China's cost advantages actually get moved over. Right, so the margin decay in China gets replaced by margin expansion in these businesses here, but now allow them to operate in parity. So it's a, I think it's a really, um, really unique moment. 